I'm Tom Rosenbauer. Welcome to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. I often think that bonefish are one of the most perfect fish for fly fishers. They live and feed in shallow water. They eat small prey perfectly suited for imitating with a fly. They're just spooky and selective enough to make things interesting. You can stalk them on foot or from a small boat. And for such a small fish, they make fast and powerful runs, enough to test the drag of a fly reel and maybe even get you into your backing. Wow. This big old bonefish came in alone and uh, just came in on the flat, very shallow water. I threw the fly to him. He came right over and ate it. They don't always do that. Oh, yeah, nice fish. That fish has already refused that fly. You're going to have to try just a slightly different pattern. The roll cast pickup is a great cast to use in a lot of fishing situations. This is a beautiful wild trout from a small stream. Just a gorgeous little fish. I say hit that bank. Let's go to that grass bed. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing, Tarpon Key Lodge, Bahamas Tourism, Adipose Boat Works, Global Rescue, Trout Unlimited, Oscar Blues Brewery. I just love bonefish. That's a nice fish. First, let's look at the life of a bonefish. How to find them, how they move with varying conditions and tides, and how they feed. The better you understand their behavior, the better your success and your respect for these great fish. Bonefish feed mostly in shallow water. Here they can evade their main predators, sharks and barracuda. Also, the main prey of bonefish, shrimp, crabs, worms, and small baitfish, are far more abundant in the shallow flats where we most often find them. Look for them in shallow areas with habitat that provides food. Mangroves, soft mucky flats, and turtle grass with deeper water or channels nearby. They also feed along rocky or sandy beaches where there are bars or other shallow areas. You can even find them on barren looking sand flats looking for crabs and worms. We're on this big flat in the Bahamas, big white sand flat. I've never been here before. The guide's way over there. So I'm looking at this spot here. There's a little channel that comes out and you can see it by the darker water. And then there's mangroves and a little bay back in there. So I'm gonna go poke around in that back bay because the fish will often come in on the tide and then get into the mangroves to feed. They feed on all tides. Incoming when the flats flood, and the fish can get into habitat that supports more food. In high tides, they can be way up inside the mangroves and are also more spread out, so tougher to see and to target. When the tide drops, bonefish will flood out of mangroves and deeper pockets as the water recedes. Some flats are better on an outgoing tide and some are better on the incoming. It really varies with the topography of the flat and the behavior of the local school of bonefish. The one time it is usually difficult to find fish is when the tide is high. The bonefish may be either way up inside flooded mangroves or just spread out in the higher water and difficult to find. They also don't feed as actively at slack tide, both on high and low tides, when the tide is not moving, and they also get pretty skittish at these times. Just let it sink, don't move it. Long strip, strip, stop. Long strip, add, got him. Just fantastic, <laughs> just amazing. Dead tide fish, right in slack tide, nothing's moving. 
fish aren't moving. We spotted this one little guy, you know, 90 feet out. Lead him with the cast at 60 feet. He came over and just whoop, ate it. Just like that. Super fun. Bonefish can be found in schools of many fish, usually smaller ones, or as singles, doubles, or in smaller groups, which are usually bigger fish. When bonefish feed, they prowl through the shallows scaring up prey. They'll readily pounce on nearly anything that moves and some things that don't. They're not particularly selective about what they eat as long as it fits into the shape and profile of something they've eaten recently. Bonefish are creatures of habit. The same fish will typically frequent the same flats at the same stage of the tide, barring any inclement weather or other disturbance. If you find a school on the incoming tide on a certain flat, chances are the next day they'll be in the same places, about an hour later because of the daily tide advances. But strong winds or changes in water temperature can affect their daily behavior, so be ready for the unexpected. Bonefish feed in roughly the same manner wherever they are, but the depth of the water can affect how we observe their feeding. In deeper water, we look for cruisers. These are fish that move through deeper water without showing any disturbance on the surface, other than making a wake sometimes when they cross a shallower bar. Sometimes they can be spotted if the light is not bright by looking for nervous water, which is a shimmer to the surface that is contrary to what the wind or tides might be doing. Without bright sunlight, fish like this might be tough to see because they're so well camouflaged on the bottom. Look for shadows and objects that move under the surface. Bonefish almost always never stop moving, and thus don't look for a fish shape in the water. Look for movement of indistinct objects that move in erratic directions. They can look grayish or greenish in the water, and the fish seldom have sharply defined edges, except in bright sunlight when you can spot their shadows. The hardest place to spot cruising bonefish is on darker bottoms or on mottled bottoms. They show up much better on light bottoms. It's sometimes easier to spot bonefish while wading because you're not moving, even though you don't have the same height advantage in looking into the water. From a moving flats boat, even immobile objects can appear to move to the untrained eye. This morning we've got what could be considered the perfect setup. We're in a nice calm little bay. The bonefish are moving toward us and we can see the wakes a long ways away. So we have time to set up, get ready, make a nice calm cast, put it out in front of the fish and hopefully catch some fish. But it doesn't get much better than what we've got right here. Get ready. You got your eyes on them? Yep. All right. Got my eyes on them. And then they break that rock, start casting on them. Okay. Go ahead. Get them to the right. Stop. Long strip hard. All right. No rooster tail, he didn't switch direction. Oh, there, a oh, little bit of one. There's one, there's a rooster tail. Yeah, bring your rod tip off higher. Bring your rod tip higher. One on the rock. See what he's trying to do? He's trying to smack the fly in the rock. When bonefish move into very shallow water to feed, their fins, backs, and tails will sometimes extend out of the water, making them much easier to spot. Sometimes you just see the occasional fin wink on the surface. Sometimes you'll see their dorsal fins plowing through shallow water. This is called a crawling fish. Often you'll see a fish crawl, then it will dip into deeper water and disappear, only to reappear again in another shallow spot. When bonefish are rooting for crabs and other prey on the bottom, you may see their entire tails break the surface as they perform headstands, trying to get into crevices in the mud or grass. You are especially likely to see this at dawn, dusk, and on dark days, when you can't spot them any other way. 
When one or many bonefish feed on a soft bottom, they may leave a trail of discolored water called a mud. Try to find out which direction the school is heading. The mud will be thickest in the direction they're traveling. Nice little bonefish out of a mud. Not, uh, not my favorite thing to do. You can't really stalk them, and it's actually not that challenging. But if you really need a bonefish, you really want to catch one, or especially if you want to catch your first one, a mud is a good place to go. And fish out of muds are usually pretty small. One final aspect of bonefish behavior the angler needs to understand is their wariness. Bonefish are spooked by shadows, birds, wakes made by the wading angler, fly lines landing too close to them, and even a fly that's too heavy, especially in shallower water. In fact, sometimes schools spook themselves for no apparent reason. A school of spooked bonefish may move just a few yards and then continue feeding, or the whole school can suddenly bolt for deep water. Next, we'll show how to choose flies and how to catch these stealthy creatures. Now that we know a bit about bonefish and their behavior and how to find them, let's talk about the second part of the puzzle, how to feed them. Bonefish are not terribly selective, but it pays to use a fly that looks somewhat like what they eat on a regular basis. So there are various types of bonefish flies. Um, we try to imitate the, the stuff that they eat every day. Some of the things that they eat we can't imitate, like clams and shells, uh, but they eat a lot of crabs. And we have crab flies, and if you see a lot of crabs on the bottom, or if you're back in the mangroves, probably a crab is a good idea. Uh, shrimp flies are more common um, in grass beds and sometimes over white sand bottoms or mixed bottoms. These flies imitate shrimp, and then there's other flies that who knows what they imitate. This might be a, a worm or, or some other kind of aquatic organism that bonefish like to eat. So there isn't a real wide variety of bonefish flies like you might find in, in trout flies or flies for other species. Uh, basically, you have the biggest hook you're gonna use is like a size four or a two, and that would be for Bahamas and Florida, Cuba. And then kind of the general purpose um, is size six, which you could use most anywhere. And then if you're going to places like Mexico, Belize, and um, Christmas Island, they prefer smaller flies as small as a size eight or even a 10. So you don't need a wide variety of bonefish patterns. Usually there's one or two that work really well in any given area. Um, but most important is the weight of your bonefish flies. So whatever pattern or patterns you take with you on a bonefish trip, you're gonna need them in three weights. You're gonna need some lead-eyed bonefish flies or solid metal eyes uh, to get down into the deeper channels and some of the deeper flats. Bead chain eyes, are kind of the standard in most depths of water where you're gonna find bonefish, kind of a medium depth, uh, maybe uh, two to four feet of water. And then if the fish are really spooky or you're in really shallow water and there's tailing fish, you might want some with plastic eyes or no eyes at all. This lands on the water very lightly and it sinks very slowly. So. Uh, whatever you do, make sure that you have three weights of bonefish flies. You want to fly with enough weight to sink to the level of the fish in a couple seconds. But you don't want one that plunks right to the bottom because it can spook fish or get hung up on the bottom before you have a chance to move it. So we know bonefish eat invertebrates, but that's not all they eat. They also eat a lot of bait fish, especially big bone fish. In fact, the crazy Charlie, which is a very, very famous Bahamian bonefish fly, was actually developed to imitate a glass minnow, not a shrimp, although a lot of people use it for a shrimp imitation. And you know, sometimes certain bonefish flies just work better in other regions. For instance, the Christmas Island special obviously works well in Christmas Island, but it's a super popular pattern here in Belize, and they use it in little tiny sizes for bonefish and bigger, heavily weighted sizes for permit. 
The general shade on the fly is considered important by most people. Since bonefish prey are well camouflaged to their environment, they tend to match the bottom shade. So a dark fly over turtle grass or other dark bottom is a good choice. Over a white sand bottom, on the other hand, you might pick a white or pale tan fly. It just makes sense. Bonefish aren't used to seeing prey that doesn't match the bottom shade. Bonefish tackle is relatively simple. For smaller fish and smaller flies, some people go as light as a six weight or a seven weight. If you might encounter permit or small tarpon on the flats, and where you have lots of wind, you might pick a nine weight. But the eight weight rod is standard and perfect for most bonefish locations. You won't need any line other than a good floating line in a reel with a strong, smooth drag and 150 yards of backing. Leaders should test between 12 and 16 pounds with nine footers being standard. However, where fish are spooky, a 12 footer might be more appropriate in order to keep the fly line further from the fish. A leader landing near a bonefish won't spook it, but a heavier fly line might. So I'm gonna show you how to modify a bonefish leader. I was bonefishing yesterday with this leader and it's got two problems. One of the things is it's too short, okay? I was throwing over schools of bonefish and I was spooking them because I wasn't keeping that heavy fly line far enough away from the bonefish. The leader landing on them doesn't seem to bother them. So I need to make this leader longer. The other problem is that I changed flies a bunch of times. I started out with a nine foot, 12 pound leader, but it's gotten thicker and thicker because it's a knotless tapered leader. And I think the end of this leader is now too heavy for those bonefish. In fact, I think it's actually too heavy to tie on a piece of 12 pound. So what I'm gonna have to do with this end, I'm gonna have to tie a piece of 16 pound on here, just a short little piece, and then tie a new tippet of 12 pound on the end. The first thing I'm gonna do is make my leader longer. So I'm gonna just back my leader off the fly line, just back the loop to loop connection out and take the leader off. Now I'm gonna take that loop on the butt section of my leader and I'm gonna cut it off. Next, I'm gonna take some 40 pound monofilament. Now I know from the package that the butt section on my original leader was 21 thousandths of an inch. This stuff is 23 thousandths of an inch, a little bit heavier, but close enough. I'm gonna take three feet of this or so, depending on how much longer you want your leader to be and how much you can cast. I'm gonna take three feet of that or so. I'm gonna tie that to my old leader with a three turn blood knot. And then I'm just gonna tie a perfection loop on the end of here and I got a brand new leader. Instead of a nine foot leader, I've got about a 12 foot leader. So now I've got to get back to a longer 12 pound tippet. And it's really too heavy, I think, to tie 12 pound directly to this and have the knot hold well. So what I'm gonna to have to do is cut the old tippet off and I'm gonna take a piece of 16 pound, not too much, just a little transition section, maybe eight, six, eight inches or so. And I'm gonna tie that to the, the end of my leader, the other end, not the butt section. So I don't need much there. I'm just not comfortable tying the 12 pound onto this heavier stuff. But now, I'm a lot more comfortable tying the 12 pound to the 16 pound. I think the knot's gonna hold better. So now I can put my tippet on the end of this shorter section and tie this on with a blood knot. And my leader is now ready to fish and I'm a lot happier with it. If you're with a guide, you don't need to worry about finding fish. But if you're on your own, check satellite maps for areas with the most flats. Although you can also find them on little isolated flats along a beach. Then be prepared to walk or run your boat a lot. If you're on foot, 
Make sure you have good flats boots with liner socks or you'll tear up your feet. Save the sandals and bare feet for just hopping out of a boat for a brief wade. Now that you're on a bonefish flat, whether in a boat or wading, move slowly and look out beyond a cast length. In the distance, look for nervous water or the glints of fins and tails as the fish poke their fins above the water. And ignore very shallow water at your peril. It's amazing how stealthy bonefish can be even in a foot of water. A mistake people make often when bone fishing from a boat is looking too close to the boat. Yeah, you can see into the water easier right in front of the boat, but you're not gonna see any bonefish that you can cast to there. You need to cast your gaze further out ahead of you. You're not gonna see them as well, but by looking further out there, you'll train your eye better to see those bonefish coming in. And the thing about it, when a bonefish is close to the boat, it's difficult to, for you to cast to it. Because when you cast right to the boat, it's a lot of slack in the line, and you have to strip that in to get the tension on the line. So it's, it's not going to happen. Very out of 100, you may get one, one, one out of 100. So it's difficult. So you have to cast away from the boat and look away from the boat. When you got variable sunlight like we do today, in and out of the clouds, and you're waiting a flat, it's best to stop when the sun goes behind a cloud and wait, because you could walk right up on a bonefish and not see it. So stand there for a minute while it's cloudy, wait for the sun to come back out, and then start moving again. You know, I'm constantly harping on practice your casting, practice your casting before you go saltwater fishing, particularly if you're used to trout fishing or some other freshwater fishing. And something that Ernest just reminded me of is that people, when they may start to make a cast for a fish, they start looking at their line, looking at their back cast, looking at their rod. Never take your eyes off the fish. Be comfortable enough with your casting that you don't have to look at it. Now that you have one spotted, hang on. Next, you'll learn how to present the fly, play that speedy fish, and release it carefully. Good. Strip. Oh, yeah, nice That's fish. Yeah. yeah, baby. Ah. That's a good start. Yeah. You know, when you come into a flat, you always want to be ready. As soon as the boat stops, you want to be ready with your rod. We pulled into this flat, and David said, there he is, 9 o'clock. And I had line out. I was ready. Made one short cast. Fish jumped on the fly. So always be ready as soon as you get into a flat, because you never know when you're going to see him. In presenting a fly to a bonefish, there are two schools of thought. Hit him almost on the head, where you either spook them or hook them or lead them by a bit. Here, David Nemour of Andros Island shares with me the strategy that he likes. So part of my job is basically watching the fish and the fish's language. And so if I'm casting to a fish and if they're in schools and I'm casting to the fish and the fish drops, the fly drops close to the fish and he's not moving or it doesn't spook him, then that means he's not seeing the fly. So then I want to pop it a little closer to the head, maybe about two inches off, really on top of them, especially if you're doing a lot of wading and you've got tailing fish and you're casting on them and they're not moving about six inches or eight inches or foot away for, for the fly. You want to drop the fly two inches in front of his face or an inch to the left or right of his face. So that's on a fish that's tailing or just maybe extend to be ignoring the fly. He's not seeing the fly. So you want to put it as close as you can, you can to that fish. Otherwise, if you're fishing, schooling fish, and what we've seen like today, you could drop that fly 10 feet in front of the fish because the fish is coming towards the fly. So when you got fish that's coming towards the fly in schools, you could drop it 10 feet, 4 feet, and strip it when it hits about 2, two feet away from the fish. Watch carefully here how the first cast lands too far from the fish and they don't see it. Then the second cast is right in front of the fish and the lead fish takes the fly as it drops to the bottom. The trouble with leading is sometimes the bonefish may change direction as they seldom feed in a straight line. Also, if the bottom is weedy or rocky, your fly can sink to the bottom before the fish get to it and get snagged. Ideally, the fly should be almost to the bottom when a bonefish reaches it. 
The natural reaction of most prey is to spook off the bottom when disturbed and then drop back to the bottom quickly. As the fish gets close to the fly, give it about an inch of movement. Watch the movement of the fish. If it turns on the fly or shows excitement, draw the fly slowly. Don't strip too fast. If the fish shows no reaction, give the fly a long strip. You'll either hook the fish, or if it didn't eat the fly, you may get a reaction strike. But that stop is very important so that the fish inhales the fly. Otherwise, you get short strikes or the fish gets off quickly if it's just hooked on the outside of the lip. And it's important to use that long strip to strike a bonefish. Raising the rod tip, like in trout fishing, usually pulls the fly away from the fish, but it's a hard habit to break. Guides can see the fish better than you can, and they have a lifetime of experience reading the body language of a bonefish. Listen as Andros Island bonefish guide Glister Wallace calls out directions to Mark Melnick as he watches a fish's reaction to the fly. Strip, you behind him, strip. One cast. There you go, strip, 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 stop. Hit him, hit him, stop. Strip, stop, stop, leave it. Pick it up and go again. There's two fish right there, good. One more time, leave it, leave it, leave it. Strip, strip, stop. Stop, good. That's here. You gotta kind of spoon feed these fuckers. Wow, right? man, they are spooky here. Yeah, you have to spoon feed them. Just beautiful. He may be injured, but he's still got a fight in him. Sure does. Big heart. Yeah, still in the game. It's a big fish too, you know. Wonder what that's from. I have no idea, but it almost one looks like an osprey though. Easy guy, easy. There you go. Yeah, that's not a fish, that's an osprey. Yeah. The claw. Good fish. Yep. Don't be afraid to experiment with retrieves, though. There's no single right way to retrieve a bonefish fly. Sometimes a very fast retrieve will work, and sometimes just a slow crawl will get a strike. Try to read the body language of a bonefish. When they just follow a fly, they're mildly interested. But when they flare their gills and tip up on a fly, you know you have their number. And that's the exciting thing about bonefishing. Most of the time, it's all visible. Also, bonefish take off faster than most fish you are used to. A fly line that gets tangled around your feet or an object in the boat or around the reel handle can cause you to break off a fish. To help clear your line when a bonefish first runs, separate your hands as wide as possible to keep line from wrapping around your reel or rod handle. Once you have the line cleared and on the reel, just enjoy the ride. Let the fish run until it slows, then try to put pressure on the fish to regain line. If the bonefish makes another run, and they usually do, just let it go until it slows down again. And if you see the end of your fly line about to go through the guides, point your rod tip at the fish to help clear the backing knot from the guides. Be very careful if you have sharks in the area. One major concern when fighting bonefish is sharks, which are attracted by the struggles of a bonefish. If you see a shark headed toward your fish, use maximum pressure to try to get it in quickly. You may even break the fish off, but that'll let it swim free and escape the shark while it still has enough reserve power. And if one or more sharks gets attracted by your angling, it's best to leave the flat rather than sacrifice these valuable fish. Or you can put on a wire leader and a popper or streamer and try to catch the shark. Now what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> Sharks are a lot of fun on a fly rod, if you can figure out what to do with them when you get them close to the boat. Got him! Once you get a bonefish close, 
Grab the leader and bring the fish to you. If the bonefish makes a sudden bolt, release the leader and play the fish from the rod again for a second try. Handling time is one of the most critical parts of releasing bonefish. Remove the fly, hold the fish up for a brief photo if you want, and hold it in the water until it takes off on its own. Don't move the fish back and forth in the water. Just let them rest in clear water. If you played and handled a bonefish properly, it should take off as soon as you release your grip on it. Pliers are helpful, as sometimes bonefish take flies deep into their crushers. This is especially common when using crab patterns. You've probably seen me make some decent casts, and yeah, I'm an okay caster, but you're never gonna be good enough to make all the shots in bone fishing. But the more you practice before you go on a bone fishing trip, the better off you're gonna be. Practice your accuracy, practice your distance, practice in the wind. Um, you're going a long way to fish for these fish and you're spending a lot of money. Don't ruin it by not being able to make that cast. In all situations, strive to make as few false casts as possible and no false cast if you can manage it. A fly line in the air is more likely to spook a bonefish and the more casts you make, especially in the wind, the greater the chance you'll find yourself with a tangle. If you're fishing from a boat, it's extremely helpful to be competent on casting from your off shoulder. You never know when a bonefish may suddenly appear on the wrong side of a flats boat. For some really helpful tips on how to cast over your off shoulder, even into the wind, Let's visit my friend Pete Kutzer for some valuable lessons. Hi, I'm Pete Kutzer with the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools. Today I want to talk to you about making a backhand presentation with your fly rod. When we're casting with a fly rod, we have two casts that we're making all the time. We're making a back cast and we're making a forward cast. Both of these casts are great fishable casts. And that back cast, if we can make a good one at our target, it's going to double the chances of us catching those fish. We'll be able to deliver that fly in any direction. When we want to make a backhand shot, there's a couple things that we want to keep in mind. One thing that I really like to do is take my right shoulder, I'm a right-handed caster, and point it at my target. If I'm going to cast out in this direction, I point my shoulder right at my target, I can make a forward cast up in the air, back cast, I can deliver right there to those fish. There's a couple things we got to be careful of, though, when we make this backhand shot. One, we want to make sure that we don't sweep our rod around to point at our target. If we do that, our fly a lot of the time will go past our target and we'll miss our mark. The second thing is we wanna make sure that we get that loop to turn over on top. We don't want that side loop because again, we can lose a little accuracy. So to get that loop to turn over on top, what I like to do is keep my index finger on top of the rod right here. That's gonna allow that loop to turn over on top and come out very nicely and accurately to our target. This backhand shot is a great cast when we have windy conditions as well. Just turn around and make that back cast. You make a back cast all the time, make it your fishing cast. It's a very effective technique and it's gonna help you catch a lot more fish. Finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention perhaps the most difficult aspect of bone fishing for fly fishers used to freshwater fishing. And no, it's not spotting fish. You know, one of the biggest problems that freshwater anglers, in particular wading anglers, have in saltwater is not so much spotting the fish. That comes with a day or two. But one of the things I see that really wigs people out is the fact that the wind is blowing, the boat is moving, the tide is moving, and the fish are moving. And you have to put all these things together in your head when you deliver that fly to the fish. One of the things I like to do is just occasionally glance at the bottom. Most of the time you're gonna be looking out beyond your cast, but occasionally look at the bottom to see which way the boat is moving in relation to what's going on out there. But the complexity of figuring out that puzzle and all the other ones you face when chasing bonefish is what makes bonefishing so rewarding. Bonefish are one of the most perfect fish for the fly rod, and if you haven't tried it, you're missing one of life's greatest pleasures. And the grabbing of the leader. Whoops. That's a nice bonefish. Yeah.
strip it, strip it, stop, stop, don't move, strip it slow, long strips, strip it faster, get, fast, get a lead across them, <laughs> stop, stop, long strip, take it out right one, oh, you got him, sorry, <laughs> I didn't see the second fish eat, yeah, I didn't see him eat either, <laughs> Yeah! Whoa, man! You're working it hard. Fish are tough. Yeah. Uh. That's why I love bone fishing. You know, it, it can be easy some days and they eat every fly, and other days it can be incredibly difficult, frustrating, um, but it's always fun. So that's what we were seeing yesterday. Oh, nice fish. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing Tarpon Key Lodge Bahamas Tourism Adipose Boat Works Global Rescue Trout Unlimited Oscar Blues Brewery